let's thank you so much uh, for that generous introduction. And, and <clears throat> thank you, great thanks also to Sharon and to Melanie and all the organizers for inviting me. It really is such a delight to be here, to be with so many friends from, from many parts of my life who've been a really important part of my life for a long time. And there's also, there's a, there's a very special delight about uh, seeing former students uh, sort of transform into a senior generation and playing a really crucial role in producing a new generation of critical scholars. So it's a great thrill for me, it really is. Um, what I also realize is how deeply I have been influenced by them over the years, how they've played a really important part in producing me. And of course, you know, what, what I'm doing here is a kind of a reverse disclaimer. You know, instead of saying that, um, that any mistakes that I made, that and I make are on mine alone, I'm, it's, it's all their fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, what I really would like to do today is to take off from Kristen Ross's recent book um, entitled Communal Luxury, The Political Imaginary of the Paris Commune, uh, that very recently came out with Verso. And when I read the book a couple of weeks ago, I was really struck by its powerful direct relevance to the themes of the panel, as well as to the workshop more generally, um, but also to really important political debates going on in South Africa and elsewhere. And what I want to do in this talk is to make two moves. First of all, I want to really talk through what is it that I found so compelling about the book. I'm going to have to do this in a very brief, skeletal way, but I really want to convey why I think it's really important that this book be widely read. Um, but the second thing I want to do as well is to reflect on the question of how does one get from the excitement and the inspiration of Ross's portrayal of the Paris Commune as communal luxury to the very massive challenges of the present conjunction. And it seems to me that on the one hand, what we've seen, uh, especially since 2011, is the resurgence of critical social movements on the left. And you know, indeed, what Ross does is she describes how she was inspired to go back and rethink the Paris Commune by the occupation-based political strategies of seizing space uh, and, and remaking space that burst onto the scene in 2011. Um, but at the same time, it seems to me, what we've also seen uh, over a longer period and still very much with us is the resurgence of white, of, of, of virulent right-wing, if not fascist forces in many regions of the world. Uh, the resurgence of, of violent racisms and xenophobia that are deeply tied in with persistent nationalisms and that it seems to me are emblematic of how neoliberal forms of capitalism work in and through articulations of nationalism, race and difference. And how we think about these interconnections, it seems to me, um, are crucially important to any political strategy because these invocations of nationalism are not just top-down impositions. They very often have powerful popular appeal and they take also quite a specific form in post-colonial conditions and in settler societies. And one of the things that I want to do in, in, in thinking about Ross and the Paris Commune is also to suggest how Fanon, and, and quite a particular reading of Fanon, is actually very useful and important in making the move from the Paris Commune uh, to the present conjuncture. Uh, so let me sort of start off with what it is that's so compelling about Ross's account of the Paris Commune. Now, the Paris Commune was a, an occupation par excellence. 
And as she puts it, for 72 days in the spring of 1871, a worker-led insurrection transformed the city of Paris into an autonomous commune and set about improvising the free organization of its social life according to principles of association and cooperation. And what this was when it was an extraordinary working laboratory of political invention that was either improvised on the spot or cobbled together out of what she calls past scenarios and phrases. It was also massively threatening to the powers that be. And on the 28th of May, 1871, it was brought down by a bloody massacre in which thousands of communards were slaughtered. And those who survived, uh, many of them went into exile. Now, communal luxury is not in any way a conventional history of the Paris Commune. And indeed, Ross is very explicit that she's writing against a number of historiographical tendencies, the tendency of orthodox communist parties in the past to view the Paris Commune as a failed revolution that was then uh, preceded, succeeded by, the, uh, that preceded the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, it's also widely been co-opted by a sort of a triumphalist version of French Republican history. Um, but what Russ is also doing is writing against tro the trope of the Paris Commune as, tra as tragedy. What she does do is, first of all, she thinks about the praxis of the Paris Commune as a working laboratory. And as she points out, communist thought has historically received very little attention. And what she focuses on is what the insurrectionists did, the significance they gave to their actions, the names and words they embraced, imported, and disputed that have been largely ignored. And what she produces is a very rich, almost ethnographic account of the everyday practices and meanings of the commune. And as Marx pointed out, what mattered most was not the ideals of the Paris commune, but its own working existence. And some of the, the elements of this working existence that seem to me so important and powerful is first of all, it represented a rejection of nationality and nationalism. It was, as one communard said, an audacious act of internationalism. Uh, the communards saw Paris not as the capital of France, but as a universal republic to which foreigners were freely admitted and welcomed. And they saw it as an autonomous, or envisioned it as an autonomous unit in an international federation of communes. It also represented a break with the legacy of the French Revolution uh, in the direction of real working class internationalism. And what Ross uh, points to is three key acts that signified this. Firstly, the burning of the guillotine. Um, secondly, the, the destruction of the Vendome column, column that was built to glorify uh, Napoleon's uh, conquests. And thirdly, and this is really fascinating, the establishment of the Women's Union. And here, a crucial role was played by a young Russian woman by the name of Elizabeth Dmitriev, who had close connections with the Russian populace as well as with Marx. And what she um, was involved in uh, with, uh, with other women was, in many ways, a feminist reworking of the Russian agrarian commune, the Opshina, in uh, an urban setting and, and in a very explicitly feminist way. Um, the other set of points that, that Russ brings out wonderfully well is what co of communal luxury as an equality of action, of an overcoming of the divisions between manual labor on the one hand and artistic or intellectual labor on the other. In terms of, in, of education, what the communards were very concerned about was to break down the sort of hierarchical structure of education. And a very important figure in all of this was Joseph Jacoteau, whom uh, Rancière has written about is in, the, in The Ignorant Schoolmaster, who promoted what he called universal education, in which every, everyone is an intellectual, everything is in everything, and that what learning is about is making connections. 
There was also a heavy emphasis on art as common to all and as integral to the process of making things. And out of this emerged a new understanding of work and labor. Um, and what communal luxury really refers to was the, was the need for beauty in everyday life. Uh, so what the commune was really doing was sort of prefiguring um, a, a, a new form of the future. And it involved, in effect, a profound critique of capitalist overproduction on the one hand, and uh, producing luxury for the rich, piles of shoddy goods for the rest, along with, with scarcity, waste, destruction. And of course, when the commune was destroyed, this extraordinary experiment, this laboratory, um, was, the parts of it were smashed apart. But what Ross is very emphatic about is that we shouldn't just mourn the commune. She argues that in addition to understanding the communist practices, what is really important is to focus on what preceded and what followed the commune. And she talks about a need for an understanding of the commune in terms of expanded temporalities and spatialities. First of all, she points out that the commune was actually preceded by a series of very intense public meetings. Um, from 1868 onwards, in a period, in fact, of very intense repression. But most importantly, it was succeeded and survived by very intense interactions between communards in exile and other intellectuals, including Marx, Kropotkin, and William Morris. Um, and what is really crucial here is the way the theory generated by the Paris Commune as part of the energies unleashed by political action lived on and were elaborated in various ways. Um, and uh, I wish I could go in more detail into uh, some of the incredible sort of theoretical insights and debates that, that, that followed the commune. But, you know, just very briefly, uh, she argues that Marx's understanding of the commodity form was actually um, very much shaped by his understanding of what was going on in the commune as the emergence of freely associated labor and, the, in fact, the dissolution of the commodity form. And that he rewrote and sharpened his analysis of the commodity form under capitalism following the destruction of the, of the, uh, of the Paris Commune. Um, the whole issue of the Russian Commune and debates around the Russian Commune and of earlier forms of communal, medieval, earlier agrarian life were very much a part of debates that followed on. And Kropot Marx himself got very interested in the Opshina, in questions of, of moving uh, straight from older agrarian forms to socialism. Um, both Kropotkin and William Morris worked very closely with a communite by the name of Rick Fu to, around the question of how to repurpose um, older social forms in, as an alternative to capitalism. And part of what they, they, they were very emphatic about was the need for a universal commune of not, the, of not isolated units, but of loose federations of interconnected units. And it seems to me that that's where the, the, the calling into questions of nation nationality uh, is incredibly important. And a, a third really important piece of all of this is the way in which communal luxury actually carried with it an ecological vision of the future, of not just relations of between people, but relations with nature. Um, as, as, as very crucial to all of this. Now, you know, so, so let me turn now to the whole question of, well, what does it mean to think about the Paris Commune in the present? And I think what is important here is that Ross emphasizes that this is not a matter of, 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 of extracting lessons from the Commune in any sort of straightforward way. She, in a, she points out that there are moments in his, there are moments, 
that we experience. When past struggles sort of leap out and present themselves as a figuration or as a proposition for a different future. And it seems to me that it's this question of a figuration, a proposition of a different future that is really most important. It's a way of thinking differently about possibilities. So just very quickly in the five minutes that I have left, um, it seems to me if we think about the whole question of, well, what does, what, 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 what can, we, can we make of this, uh, you know, I think incredibly powerful, interesting, uh, a book in the present. The, first of all, what's most immediately salient, and remembering that Ross, Ross's own inspiration came out of, um, of, of uh, uh, the whole sort of op broadly conceived Occupy movements, uh, is the, de are the, de the current debates around questions of organization. And the, it seems to me that one of the real challenges is how does one get past a, 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 a sort of a dichotomous debate around anarchism on the one hand versus a sort of orthodox Marxist-Leninist um, vanguardist party on the other. And here I think there are actually very interesting debates going on in Greece around uh, Syriza and critics of Syriza that also actually have, are very relevant to the debates we're having in South Africa around a united front. And, um, uh, you know, I just want to sort of quote to you from, from one of the scholars, activists, whom I think is making, making some, who, capturing some of these debates in an interesting way, a way, a guy by the name of Panagiotis Satiris, who talks about the need for new forms of mass critical political intellectuality. And he talks about how what we need is a united front that's not just a simple connection between different movements, but the need to think in a more strategic, in terms of a more strategic conception of a process of political formation, which is exactly what he says the metaphor of a laboratory suggests, and a political process where different experiences, sensitivities, movements, theoretical elaborations, forms of work or inquiry can converge and be articulated into a political strategy. And the other thing that's really important here, that he, point he's making that's very similar to a point that Russ is making, is the imperative for solidarity. <coughs> solidarity not as not as a, a, an ethical position, but solidarity as a political strategy. And given the horrendous divisions on the left, and given the profound dangers that we confront, it seems to me that this recognition of the imperative for solidarity as a political strategy is really important. Now, well, I think there are many other ways in which one can think of, of the salience uh, of, of, of the Paris Commune. It seems to me it's also really important uh, when we're thinking about the present to, to confront fully and recognize the challenge of racism, xenophobia, fascism, their entanglements with nationalisms, and the way nationalisms in turn are entangled with neoliberal forms of capital. And it seems to me that if we're going to confront these issues, uh, and this is like in two minutes or less, <laughs> that first of all, we actually need to go back not just to the Paris Commune uh, or the French Revolution, but very importantly also the Haitian Revolution. And the whole question of race and slavery as constitutive of capitalism and actively constitutive of the modern world. And how uh, that that constitutive dynamic in turn is deeply tied in with nationalism and imperialism. And what is interesting and important here is that the crushing of the Paris Commune, as Gramsci put it, actually inaugurated a new phase of passive revolution in Europe, more generally, in which the capital state became more, more massive, in which biopolitical forms of power, which Gramsci talked a lot about, rendering technical that which is political, uh, the question of transformism were very important. But this was also very importantly the age of imperialism, the age of intensified nationalisms. And uh, while I'm not going to go into the whole 
question of debates around theories of nationalism. It seems to me that, that Ben Anderson, Parta Chatterjee, they are very limited, provide us with very limited traction. Somebody whom I think has, has given us an enormously important frame for thinking about nationalisms is Manuka Swami. Uh, both in her critique of Ben Anderson and in her work uh, entitled Producing India. And one of the really important points that Goswami makes is that the era of high imperialism in the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century was also the period of high nationalism, was also the period of anti-colonial nationalism. So it wasn't a matter of the national modular form diffusing from the West to the rest. They were happening simultaneously in and through one another. And it seems to me that, that this sort of understanding is actually really important to any strategy of denaturalizing nationalisms in relation to capitalism in the present. And what it ena enables, I think, is a sort of a critical conjunctural comparative strategy that help us to see how these forms get put together and seeing how they get constructed is really important to taking them apart. Um, but this leads me on to Fanon, who seems to me, uh, along with Goswami, provides us with incredibly important resources for uh, denaturalizing nationalisms. And what, what, uh, what Fanon represents to me is the most powerful analysis of the specificity of anti-colonial nationalism of how they are both necessary and profoundly dangerous. And what he presented us with was not just, he was not just on about violence. He was not just a critique of the post-colonial bourgeoisie, although he was, of course, that. That what Fanon did with his understanding of a new humanism, which is very different <coughs> from a liberal humanism, is that he produced, although, although very, uh, 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 in, in a very staccato way, right? Uh, 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 but nevertheless, very powerful way. Um, an understanding of a new humanism, of the practices and processes of what is involved in a new humanism that has very powerful resonances with Kristen Ross's reading of the Paris Commune and its aftermath. And it seems to me then that in any effort to try to think about the Paris Commune in relation to the present, that Fernand has got to be a really important sort of partner in that process.